time, weather, and... Always! This is Radio VSB at 1450 at the top of the dial. Hey, Bermuda. I'm Al Seymour, and welcome to another edition of Airwaves, broadcasting in Bermuda, looking at the personalities and people that were a part of radio and television in Bermuda over the last six decades. Joining me in the studio today is veteran engineer spanning some 50-plus years, and I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Delano Ingham, who is no stranger to this great medium. Mr. Ingham, thank you for joining us on Airwaves. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Uh, it's been quite a while. Uh, you being in the industry, and I was actually three when you started. Oh, I see. Well, let's go back to your education. Like, where did you go to primary school in, in Bermuda? Well, in 1950, when Francis Patton opened in Bayless Bay, I went there as one of the first students who'd be going into the school. And then, uh, of course, uh, after finishing Francis Patton, uh, the challenge was what I was, what I was going to do for high school. And uh, my teacher, Francis Patton, told me I wasn't Barclay material. So I says, well, not only will I go to Berkeley, but I'll beat whomever you send up to, to do the exam. Back in those days, you had to pay to go to high school. So I won a scholarship. I won the Francis Patton Scholarship that took me to Berkeley. Okay, so you're a Berkeleyite like I am. I'm a Berkeleyite. You're a Berkeleyite, okay. So I guess you did well in Berkeley. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was sort of like average. I wasn't an academic. Right. I was a sports person in school. Okay. So. On completion of your studies at Berkeley Institute, what did you do postgraduate? Did you go away to school or did you stay in Bermuda? How did that progress? Well, I started working when I was five, believe it or not. I got a picture of me working when I was five. And of course, from nine until I went away to school, I farmed. I was known as a farmer. <laughs> I used to call me Farmer Brown. Well. <laughs> but uh, at that point, I said, well, you know, uh, everybody who finished high school was trying to get out of Bermuda to go to school somewhere. Right. So I rode away to school so in to find out uh, where I should be going. And uh, when I, I got an answer from the school that was dealing with electronics. And I was encouraged to do electronics because I had this gentleman who used to come to my house to try to fix my father's TV. And he wasn't successful. So I said, well, let me do electronics <laughs> so I can come home after school right. and fix my father's TV. OK, so the farming bug didn't get you. It was the electronics. It was the electronics. Bug. Bug. So then what happened? You left Bermuda and where did you I go? left Bermuda and I went to Canada at a time and it wasn't, wasn't really sharp for to be, to be a person of color going to Canada. So right. I went to right. Radio College of Canada, mm -hmm. right? And at Radio College of Canada, I did electronic engineering. And uh, I did pretty good with that. I came out, uh, I was there and uh, following that I came home, right? Uh, and uh, decided that uh, that that's what that you I should get a job, right. right? Doing, you know. So, so when you were studying in Canada, you and we're going back to what the early sixties. Early sixties. So we're talking about the days of vacuum tubes, vacuum tubes, tubes and, and uh, all those things. There was no such thing as, uh, in fact, color TV was just coming in. Right. So everything was done with vacuum tubes, vacuum and tubes. Uh, we were yeah. transitioning at that time into transistors right. and solid state, solid stuff. state stuff. Yeah. So you came home back to Bermuda. With uh, what did you get a radio? What was your certificate? I, well, I'm a, I did I'm a television and general electronics. Right. That was my certification and uh, to uh, and the background for that was to be doing electronic repairs. So uh, right. even in my final exam, they put 32 TVs in front of me, and uh, I was to di diagnose the problems with those right. TVs. And one of those TVs, uh, three of them actually were color. Right, with the first color TV sets we were in country. Interesting. So I guess the first thing you did coming back home was fix your dad's television. Right? Well, by that <laughs> time I got back home, my father had already disposed of the television set. <laughs> he got a new television. Right. Okay, so now you're back in Bermuda, and this is what, 1965? 1965. 65. And by sheer coincidence. Sheer coincidence. I had an uncle who was a, who was a director at, a, at one of the radio and TV, or one of the radio stations. Right, And right. he encouraged me. He said, look, there's a TV station, my mom, getting ready to open, why don't you go and apply for a job? 
Right. right? And, and I and rent and to up the North Shore to what was going to be Z, ZFB. Television. Television. By the sea. By the sea. By the sea. And that was basically, obviously, the station that was founded by Mr. Montague, Montague Shepard, Shepard, which was radio back, radio back three, three years before that. Yeah, well, they were transitioning out right. of radio from up in Barclay Road right. down to By the Sea, right? They, they were moving the radio station down there, and uh, they were building right. the TV studios. Okay, so just real quick, tell me how you actually got the job. Well, uh, I had to go into the, um, what we call the oval room of the office <laughs> the down there at, uh, at ZFB By the Sea. Right, right. And uh, I had uh, like five people that were interviewing me for the job. Wow. So those people who were there, a part of the, um, um, the building of the new ZFB television, right. came here from a company called Thompson Television International and the BBC. So after going through the drill of the, um, of the interview, I was being fired with questions from left, right, and center. Right. In any event, um, um, uh, that was a Friday. And I said, well, this is a chance that I'm taking. So they said that when I was finished the interview, they said they will call me. Right. Fortunately for me, before I got home, I, apparently they had called my mother. So when I got home, my mother said, well, the station just called. But they didn't call you a smartphone? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we hardly had landlines in those, in those days. Right, right. So, so uh, they wanted me to start on Monday. Right. The following Monday. You know, I was three years old, I, I said it, mm -hmm. uh, I've said it to you several times. It must have been exciting. What was it like, and, and, and what, was, what was your, like, like what did they, your responsibilities when you were there, when well, you first started? When I first started, while we were building, we was a question of laying, laying, laying everything out, putting right. the cabling in, and testing everything as we built the station, right. all towards, we were building towards the, um, the opening of the TV facility. Right, so how long was it before when you started, you started what, like a couple of months before it opened up? Uh, May, May, and the station opened up in in, in, August. in, in, in August. August. That's right. Right. Uh, so we had quite a bit of time, but a lot of the time that we had while we were even building the station, all the people who were involved in the production, all those things, right? They were everything was had to, had to be rehearsed, and right. also we had to keep the radio station, right, nine sixty radio, going. It's what I find interesting is that the whole building, everything's gone, on that spot on the North Shore. There's just tanks there now mm -hmm. you know they're just um there's no real anybody driving across wouldn't even know there was a broadcast mm -hmm. uh, company there and so uh we're talking 1965 we're talking black and white television mm -hmm. and uh what were some of the challenges the early challenges working in for example using 16 millimeter and using the tube cameras how did you find that in Ortega? well it was a lot of work i can say a lot of innovation that had to take place because, and a lot of imagination because th in those days there was nothing that was instant right. other than radio. Right. right. So the film processing that we had to do, we had to plan the day well in advance. The news stories had to be planned well in advance of our doing the job. Right. So uh, a lot of those things that we were doing in those days, right, mm -hmm. was uh, getting to know the equipment, getting to know how to operate the equipment. We, be, we had people on board who were helping us do this. And, and I, like I said earlier, we, we started uh, our newscast at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. Because we knew when the film came in, the film stories came in, which had to be processed, splice, all those things, splice and edited. all that type of stuff had to be done to it. Right. And then we had to be ready to go on the air for 7 o'clock with the news. Well, obviously, I mean, people know me and they know of my father who was in broadcasting. Uh, he started in 62 at ZFB, mm -hmm. and he told me a lot that when he was there that there were a lot, a lot of it was on the job training. You were learning, the, you were learning the techniques, mm -hmm. and um, from an engineering standpoint, uh, was it, I mean, like, did, did the equipment work, or did it, did it have a lot well, of problems? Well, I said the, the equipment worked. <laughs> I can tell you, it was uh, uh, called a battleship type equipment, came from the UK. <laughs> Right, it was pie equipment, and I can right. say to you that that equipment very seldom, if any, if ever failed. Right, right. it was uh, Trojan type equipment. But compared to today's stuff, I mean, it must have been hot. I mean, the, how did they how did they chill the station down? Well, how did we, you keep it cool? Well, my, one of our directors happened to be Gilbert Darrow, yes. who ran a, a meat cooling um, um, facility for grocery stores and stuff. So he brought one of his meat coolers down there. A, wait a minute, a, a meat, meat cooler. A meat cooler. One of those refrigerators that you find in the, in the grocery stores today. And we had that outside of the building by North Shore. So no Mr. And we had a fan <laughs> that blew the air into the control room. Right. Okay. And your specific job, what was the title? Were you like junior engineer well, or apprentice? I, or? 
I went in as an operational engineer first, right? And our job was primarily to make sure that we used to sit, we, had, we used to have shifts, we used to sit and operate all the controls and everything, video writing, we used to call it, and sound writing, and all those things we had to do for the actual presentation. Mind you now that the station didn't come on the air until like 6 o'clock at night. We right. were not a 24 right. hour yeah. operation. Very right. few were. We were doing, uh, it was a challenge just to do the six hours that we were doing. We were on from, from 6 until midnight. Okay, so from my research and everything, uh, 16 millimeter was the standard format of, you know, shooting the news, television programs. But what came after that? I mean, when did the first, like, videotape get to Bermuda? Videotape came in, in fact, uh, in the mid-70s, mid I'm, I'm thinking, because yeah. uh, I don't know how my memory is for this stuff. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, my research was that uh, at least you guys used film up until at least the late 60s. When, um, and I remember my father telling me, he said when they bought the first videotape machine and installed, mm -hmm. it was like a, 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 a two-inch machine. It was two a two-inch. Two-inch two machine. For those of you and our viewers, it's the videotape was like two inches two wide. Inches, yeah. And the VTR machine that we used, or the videotape machine that we used, yeah. uh, it was like seven, eight racks. One videotape machine took up a room. So a room? A thousand, no less than a thousand vacuum tubes to keep it going. My right, goodness. So, and I can tell you that the quality, while we were only in black and white, but we were running uh, a video that was uh, color on black and white machines. Right, because in right. those days, our transmitter wasn't able to do color pictures. Right. I'm, I, I mean, I, as, a, as a young boy, I, I knew I had, a, I had a rich aunt, and she had a color TV. I mean, I'm, I'm going back in 1970. And I used to try to figure out, I wonder how the black and white gets to, but I guess the signal is made so that color, black and white televisions could, could still see a color picture. And color hadn't arrived color yet. Had arrived, yeah, but yeah. Um, we are coming up to a first break. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to continue talking to who I consider one of the maestros of broadcasting, Mr. Delano Ingham. So stay tuned to Airways. We'll be right back. Everyone wants to lower their energy bill. The following is an energy saving tip from the Department of Energy. Replace burnt out light bulbs with Energy Star certified LEDs, which use 75% less energy than traditional incandescent light bulbs. Find out more energy tips at the Department of Energy on gov.bm or facebook.com slash Bermuda government. If you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, it's important to act fast. Helping to save a life is easier than you might think. Just start hands-only CPR. The first step is to send someone to call 911 or call 911 yourself. I will stay on the phone with you until help arrives. Then get directly over the victim. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest. Then put your other hand on top of the first. I need you to do it this fast. One, two, three. Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, It's important to push at a rate of at least 100 beats per minute. 20, 21. Let's hope you never have to use hands-only CPR. But if you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, don't be afraid to try it. Remember, call 911. Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Your actions can help save a life. Welcome back to Airwaves, a look at broadcasting in Bermuda over the last six decades. And in studio with me today is Mr. Delano Ingham. You know, personality in Bermuda, and might I add, a good cornet player? Cornet player, yes. Trumpet player. Trumpet player. Cornet player. Cornet player. Cornet player. Okay, yes. all right. <laughs> when we left off, Mr. Ingham, we were talking about just near the end of the 1960s where we were into videotape, and then the big innovation came color television. There were two broadcasting stations in Bermuda, Bermuda Broadcasting, competing with ZFB. And who was the first to go color? And explain to me how that happened. Well, uh, f first of all, we need to get to the point of 1970, right, uh, when I became the chief engineer. 
So you became, wait a minute, chief engineer. So that's a short period. Short period, yes. Wow. I was quite challenging because uh, at that time uh, we, we were heavily influenced by those first who, persons who were there to uh, initial, initialize the station. Right. So it was quite challenging. So one day I decided that I'm going to be the chief engineer. You right? decided. I decided. <laughs> right. As uh, the, the, the station had brought somebody in to oversee me, and I took the decision I'm not going to be teaching anybody else how to do what I was doing. Right. So uh, I became the chief engineer after a little bit of protest on my part. Right. But in 1970, uh, we were, we were uh, I was in, extra, in the studio one day, right. uh, and I was repairing one of the, these two-inch videotape machines, and, and Montague Shepard came along, and I had uh, a picture on the waveform monitor, or electronic display on the mm -hmm. waveform monitor of the picture that was coming out of this machine. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, Mom, Delano, what is that? I says, well, that's a color picture. If we had a color monitor, we'd better see this picture in color. He says, yeah. So he jumped in his car, goes screaming out of the yard, and came back from the American <laughs> Conference Office with this floor model Zenith color, Zenith TV? color, color TV, TV set, right? <laughs> that I said, well, no, it doesn't just work like that there. I said, the, the, the television set would have to be converted so it can take video in. Right. The those days, you couldn't just take a video signal and feed it into a TV right, set. That's right, because you, you, be just, you had to yeah. get it yeah. off the yeah. rabbit yeah. That's right, right. So I, I, I said, okay, then I said, but I can make it work. Yeah. I said, but to my, the American Council not going to want his TV set back when I'm finished. <laughs> so I stripped the TV set apart and then mm -hmm. I opened it up and then I created a video input for the TV set. Right. And when he saw the picture, and I fed it out of this so machine. So it was just coming off a, vid a videotape machine. Coming off the videotape machine, straight right, in. And right. when he saw the picture, he says, man, put it out on the air, put it out on the air. I said, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not that simple. It's not that simple. I said, uh, well, you're seeing a picture here. He says, our transmitter is a black and white transmitter. We can't put this out on the air yet. So are you talking about buying a whole new transmitter? No, well, I, then I said, well, no. I said, well, what I had to then go to the drawing board because of the desperation that he had for this thing. Right. I said, well, I'm going to create a designer circuit. Right that will allow that transmitter that we had to pass color TV. And so right? the way the transmitter was built, you could modify it? Like I, not, it wasn't built to be, to be done, not the transmitter part, right. but the, the modulation part of it right, to right, be redesigned right. so to, that we to can get the color information. Get the color information right, right? Right. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but in the video signal, there is this, uh, uh, a little signal that it's called, it's called the burst that the color, color signal references. Yes. And of course, the black and white TV sets were taking all that there out, or the right. black and white transmitter was taking that there out, so I had to build a circuit to make that there happen. So you built the circuit, built the circuit to go color television. To go How television. long did it take? That took about uh, maybe two, three, a month or so to do, yeah. So where'd you get the plans for that? Or you just well, sort of... I, I had to go and put my, uh, my electronic head on and right. figure out how to design the circuit. I ended up making what we call, what I ended up calling a, string, a sync stretch circuit. Okay, so you took right. this, installed it into installed the it into transmitter. The, into the transmitter, and lo and behold, we had ourselves a color picture. So from that point, and I mean, I guess, the other broadcasting company didn't know that you were doing this. No. And uh, so how long did it take to actually, once you built the circuit, how long did it take before you put the station to color? Well, the thing is this, sir, um, at that same time that we were building the station, right, right. Uh, uh, you, you would know that in, in 65 yeah. is when ZFB opened, and in 65, ZBM were transitioning from where they were up to prospect. Up to, up to yeah. Right, and uh, uh, our black and white picture was beating them, beating, beating them down quite a, quite, <laughs> kind of seriously because the quality was so good. But that's you got so stuff. Uh, we decided that, uh, that, um, that uh, we'll take our time with this color. So in the meantime, ZBM were in, in the process. They had built the re rebuilt their studio, and they were building all this new black and white equipment right. into their studios right. to combat combat our black and white pictures that we had. Mm -hmm. So on a weekend, I remember clearly that uh, ZBM announced that fo on the following Monday they would start their their um, uh, they were initiate using their brand new black right. and white equipment. Right, right. So and but on that same time, I heard that when I heard the story, I says okay. On the Saturday, we announced that tonight's broadcast will be in color. And wow. I remember to this day, we put on four programs, right? We started with a program called the um, right. Garnet Armstrong, Strong. the Ingebert Humperdinck, 
the Tom Jones Show, and the Joey Bishop Show. Well, I do remember a uh, guy, Summers Tuesday, was talking to him. Yeah, yeah. Because he yeah. said he worked the night they went color. He said, ah, that was color. It was purple, green, and orange. Yeah, yeah. But it was color. <laughs> it was color. And he, ran, he said the Saturday morning cartoons were in color. And, uh, color that yeah. was like, wow. Yeah. Now, something else happened in the 1970s, uh, the color television innovation. You guys transitioned, you added FM to ZFB, right? FM yeah. radio, as opposed to AM. AM. Well, so, just before we go there, just let me say that, yeah. um, that we, while, we were, while we went to color, mm -hmm. much to the surprise of ZBM, right? Right. We, or I personally, got beat up on in the newspaper for, for prematurely going color. Why? Right, because they said the merchants downtown weren't ready. Color, color. Te color television. Sell it, the sale of color television. So I say, but the, the industry was had developed to the point where while we were building, we had no other choice but to be transitioning to color. Yeah. It's like today, you know what it's like? It's like today going in our high definition format. You really mm -hmm. you don't have a choice. You have to follow the You have to because I mean I guess it must be difficult because you have to follow the, technology. the black and white stuff still worked, mm -hmm. but you had to go to color yeah. for yeah, and, and yeah. So so, so anyhow, we had to, um, like, I was, we were we were like 18 months into color before ZBM and color because right. when they did the story about my going prematurely, they said, well, when ZBM get it, they're going to be better anyhow. So I said, okay, fine. <laughs> that was some of the things that we were up against as... as I uh, can, well, the thing is, in, in my research, I, I, I realized of the period between that whole 1960s period. It was a different time, Bermuda, mm -hmm. and things were, I mean, it's challenging. It was mm -hmm. very challenging for... See, I would, cause as I, I, I love broadcasting, but I think it must have been, I talked to people, they say, well, don't romanticize. It was very, in some aspects, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. But here I am talking to you today, and I think some of the stories and things and information is worth listening to. But I mentioned the FM, because FM took a long time to get, in, you know, we got, you got FM in, what, 19, close to, I think it was 1970. Uh, 95, right? I mean, FM 95. FM. Yeah. FM 95. Nine and so, nine. now, as a, as a youngster, I used to listen to FM, but I never heard any local DJs. And can you explain why most of it was on AM as opposed to FM? Well, because uh, AM was uh, a signal that can guess about get anywhere in the right. world, right? right? It was what we call ground wave. That's how the signal went about. Right. But FM and television was what we call sky wave. And we, right. uh, in actual fact, we were trans transmitting the signal toward the ionosphere. And wherever right. it hit the ionosphere and then it bounced back down, that's where the best reception was. Right, right. So, <clears throat> I mean, I had it, people had AM radios and FM radios, and the, but I, I remember listening to easy listening music, these mm -hmm. soft way, but that was pre-recorded material, right? Everything was pre-recorded. Oh, okay. I made the mistake back in the AM days, when, in fact, when I went, first went to, went to work for ZFB, yeah. right, I, I automated the AM radio station. Right. Right, uh, with, with the um, computers, and that didn't work because people had to call in two or three days ahead if they want some special request for their grandmother who was celebrating <laughs> her birthday. So that failed for us. Right, but you, but you were in charge overall, again, of television and radio. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys did a lot of innovations. You did, come on, real quick, give me your Easter, your Easter parade story. I'm giving you my 20 East, seconds. My Easter parade story. Tell, me, tell it to me quick. Uh, was uh, <laughs> 1966, we did the first live broadcast from downtown, right? And, uh, right. We had uh, to microwave the signal back to the station back in those days, and we didn't have these fancy cameras that we have today. Right. So uh, what we did was took a telecine apart, and that was a word. Telecine, those were the cameras, cameras that, for the film For, for the, the film, film uses, yeah, right. The right. Film, film uses right, uh, right, right, right. shine into this camera, and we went down <laughs> Front Street with this thing. I was on the bank of Butterfield. Somebody else was on the um, pit building. Right. We were holding these cameras, pointing them down Front Street at the East Parade. <laughs> I had to get that story. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so throughout the, eight, throughout the 70s, Leading into 1980, you and ZBM were competing against each other. They had gone color, you were color, and I mean, I'm going back to my youth. It was, you know, seven, eight, nine news innovations and stuff. And near the end of the 80s, when um, you were still the manager, uh, something happened in 83, and that didn't, didn't, I mean, we get to a point where um, there was a merger between mm -hmm. the two stations. Well, uh, to, uh, in 1981, mm -hmm. I was eventually made the managing director right. of uh, ZFB. Uh, shortly after that, right, uh, in 1982, ZBM bought uh, ZFB from the Gibbons Group. Right. And, uh, and then we were all transitioning between the by the sea up to uh, up to uh, prospect. Right. I, re I remember coming to see you in 83. I was looking for a summer job. So you remember, you might remember. I was looking for a summer job 
with the government employment, they were sort of just placing you. And I went there in 83, and you told me that, well, we're almost in transition now. Mm -hmm. And I had my one look in there, and I looked around at everything, and then I actually ended up, I because you didn't really have anything at the time, I ended up working for a different station. But no, I, 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 worked, no, I did a summer at oh. VS, I did a summer at VSB Radio. But um, and so the stations merged. The two companies merged. And, well, they were bought. ZFP was bought out. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? All the personnel went up to Pro all the personnel up to, we, up to Prospect. We went up to Prospect, and the, the people who stayed at by the sea until we had space and all those things. Right. Uh, the newsroom stayed down by the sea. Right. Uh, so in those days, when that ha transition happened. Uh, between the two stations, ZFB, ZFB and ZBM, there was like 130 staff members employed wow. to make the thing work, right? right? Uh, so uh, eventually, uh, we were starting to whittle away of those people that were there that were not necessary to have them in duplication. Right. And a lot of the new technology with, with respect to automation and, and, um, um, and uh, computer software was coming to take right. over a lot of the things that we were manually doing on typewriters. Mm -hmm. So we were able to wind down a lot of the operation. Right. After that, and without going into too much detail, but after that, there was a strike that actually closed Marina Broadcasting. And at that time, you were what? What was your position at Bermuda Cross? The same operations manager? I was a chief engineer and chief operations engineer. manager right. still. And right. uh, by this time, I had already automated the station right. uh, uh, so that that can run uh, independent of people being there. Right. So yeah, we had a strike, and, mm -hmm. uh, the and then this, the 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 station came back on many months later, mm -hmm. but without 960. 960 was gone. Yeah. 1230 was still there. Yeah, uh, was some ZBM1 was gone. Yeah, there was some shrinking so, of the operation. Right. Uh, we bought, uh, we, we bought uh, uh, the other station that we had from ZFB under ZBM because uh, what people didn't realize is that ZFB had its license and uh, in, the, in the merger, right. they couldn't sell the license. Right. So whoever was uh, ZBM purchasing Z, ZFB, had to take that license with them. Right, right. So uh, that meant we got rid of one of the, one of the AM stations at, uh, at, uh, at ZBM. Well, you know, it's funny, I'm just looking at my clock and I'm thinking, okay, uh, we're in the 90s. I, I remember the transition from, they took channel 10 and made it nine, mm -hmm. and channel uh, seven remained, so eight became seven, mm -hmm. 10 became nine, as we move into the 90s and into the 2000s. When did you finally, re I wouldn't say retire, but when did you, when did you finish up at ZBM? I finished up at ZBM in the, after 40 years and one day working there uh, in nine, uh, 2005, right? Uh, the, 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 all the live broadcasts up until that point, I was doing and I'm still doing them up until this day, right? right? And for the first time in 55 years, I didn't get to go to do CopNet, <laughs> right? So uh, live broadcasts is, so, is one of the things I did. So on just before we wrap up, um, your personal life, I mean, I know you're in the Salvation Army, and I know you play and you mm -hmm. sing, and mm -hmm. um, what are your other interests? Just uh, well, how, do you keep, how do you keep, I, I know you do work here I, at CITV as well. I'm but. a consultant for you guys, but what, <laughs> I, what I find that most interesting, I like people, I like to see technology developing, and I like to be able to be giving back to the community. Right, so in my right. life, I've done a whole pile of things. I've got a drawer full of stuff that there's no space to hang it on the wall now. Now for for for, for, so, for citations and stuff. So well, I would tell you, I was going to write a book, but it sounds like you need to write a book. The only problem about <laughs> writing a book is is the chronologically way it would have to be done, <laughs> right? And uh, you would yeah. have to be remembering date by right, date by date. Right. And I can't write it as a story; it can be as a factual book. Right. Well, Mr. Ingham, you know we're out of time, and I really looked forward to this today and I hope that a lot of people see this and remember that you know they're standing on some big shoulders mm -hmm. and I want to thank you for coming to Airwaves it's today. It's been, been my pleasure. Yes okay. Thank you. Well that's it for this edition of Airwaves. Glad you could join us today and we look forward to bringing you many more personalities from Bermuda's great broadcasting history here in our studio. For CITV, I'm Al Seymour.